Good afternoon, brothers and sisters in our Lord Jesus Christ and young people. And also I know we have some friends with us today. So a very warm welcome to our 2022 Prophecy Day here. And we have some greetings to let you know about. So we have greetings from the Nelson Ecclesia in New Zealand. And so hello Nelson, nice to see you today. We understand that their whole Ecclesia is gathering to uh, zoom in, YouTube in, I think it is. Um, and I understand they're having some hot soup while they watch. So hello Nelson and thank you for joining us uh, across the ditch over there. Now, there's a couple of things that I think of in days like this. Firstly is the great blessing we have to come together. It's become a little bit of a, an institution, an excellent tradition to assemble and each year and think about what's happening in the world. So that's a wonderful thing. The second thing I think of is I suspect there's never ever been a time in the history of man where so much has happened in so short a time. I think you'll agree with that. And every month, every week, even every day, we can say, wow. And so we thank our God for today and the occasions that we have. Today we're going to have two presentations, the first on Israel, the second on Russia and Ukraine and the world more broadly. And we look forward to that. So if you'll rise, we'll open with a hymn and prayer. And our opening hymn is number 320.
Our Father, we recognise Thee as the great God of heaven and of earth, the only powerful one. We thank Thee for our knowledge of Thee and of Thy Son, our Lord and Master, Jesus the Christ. And we thank Thee for Thy word that we are able to read as often as we would with the full permission of the government of this country. And we thank thee for the more sure word of prophecy, to which we do well that we take heed, as unto a light that shines in the dark of this crazy and tumultuous world, until the new day dawn, and we will be with our Lord for evermore. Please guide our time together this afternoon. We are so grateful for the opportunity to meet, for the guides and the understanding we have to tap into thy word, and for the very real fulfilments in prophecy that we can consider. And the fulfilments that we, we do see give us absolute confidence that the prophecy of the return of thy son will be fulfilled too, and that his return must be near, and may it come soon. And so we ask that thou would be with our time this afternoon, with our presenters, and with the hearts of every person here and those watching, that everything may be done to thine honour and to thy glory. And we approach before thee through the name of thy dear Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our first presentation is to be given by Brother Greg Pogson from the Yarraman Ecclesia, which is uh, northwest of Brisbane in Queensland, and his title is Israel, the Obdurate Nation. You would have picked that word up in our first hymn. And to introduce his presentation, we'll read together from Isaiah and chapter 49. Isaiah and chapter 49. Isaiah 49, listen, O isles, unto me, and hearken ye people from afar. The Lord hath called me from the womb, from the bowels of my mother hath he made mention of my name. And he hath made my mouth like a sharp sword, in the shadow of his hand hath he hid me, and made me a polished shaft, in his quiver hath he hid me. And said unto me, Thou art my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. And then I said, I have laboured in vain. I have spent my strength for naught and in vain. Yet surely my judgment is with the Lord and my work with my God. And now, saith the Lord, that formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob again to him, Though Israel be not gathered, yet shall I be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. And he said, It is a light thing that thou shouldst be my servant, and to raise up the tribes of Jacob, and to restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles, that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. Thus saith the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel, and his Holy One, to him whom man despiseth, to him whom the nation abhorreth, to a servant of rulers, kings shall see and arise. Princes also shall worship because of the Lord that is faithful and the Holy One of Israel, and he shall choose thee. Thus saith the Lord, in an acceptable time have I heard thee, 
and in a day of salvation have I helped thee, and I will preserve thee, and will give thee for a covenant of the people to establish the earth, to cause to inherit the desolate heritages, that thou mayest say to the prisoners, Go forth. To them that are in darkness, show yourselves. They shall feed in the ways, and their pastures shall be in all high places. They shall not hunger nor thirst, neither shall the heat nor sun smite them. For he that hath mercy on them shall lead them. Even by the springs of water shall he guide them. And I will make all my mountains away, and my highways shall be exalted. Behold, these shall come from far, and, lo, these from the north and from the west, and these from the land of Sinem. Sing, O heavens, and be joyful, O earth, and break forth into singing, O mountains. For the Lord hath comforted his people, and will have mercy upon his afflicted. But Zion said, The Lord hath forsaken me, and my Lord hath forgotten me. Can a woman forget her sucking child, that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, they may forget, but will I not forget thee? Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Thy walls are continually before me. Thy children shall make haste. Thy destroyers and they that made thee waste shall go forth of thee. Lift up thine eyes round about, and behold, all these gather themselves together, and come to thee. As I live, saith the Lord, thou shalt surely clothe thee with them all, as with an ornament, and bind them on thee, as a bride doeth. For thy waste and thy desolate places, and the land of thy destruction, shall even now be too narrow by reason of the inhabitants, And they that swallowed thee up shall be far away. The children which thou shalt have, after thou hast lost the other, shall say again in thine ears, The place is too straight for me. Give place to me that I may dwell. Then shalt thou say in thine heart, Who hath begotten me these, seeing I have lost my children, and am desolate, a captive, and removing to and fro? And who hath brought up these? Behold, I was left alone. These, where have they been? Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will lift up mine hand to the Gentiles, and set up my standard to the people, and they shall bring thy sons in their arms, and thy daughters shall be carried upon their shoulders. And kings shall be thy nursing fathers, and their queens thy nursing mothers, They shall bow down to thee with their face toward the earth and lick up the dust of thy feet. And thou shalt know that I am the Lord, for they shall not be ashamed that wait for me. Shall the prey be taken from the mighty or the lawful captive delivered? But thus saith the Lord, even the captives of the mighty shall be taken away and the prey of the terrible shall be delivered. For I will contend with him that contendeth with thee, and I will save thy children. And I will feed them that oppress thee with their own flesh, and they shall be drunken with their own blood as with sweet wine. And all flesh shall know that I, the Lord, am thy Saviour and thy Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. So I want to invite Brother Greg to come forward and present our first address, uh, Israel, the obdurate nation. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Chairman. My dear brethren and sisters, in the confidence that we have of this more sure word of prophecy, and of course our young people. I guess I should introduce myself, as not too many of you will know that uh, I'm a shy and retiring brother from rural Queensland, and 
this trip to the big city is way outside my comfort zone. Let me explain that um, where I live is a small country town with a population of uh, 3,599 people according to the last census and we have in our community a disproportionate number of redneck Queensland farmers all of whom have their own language and terms and expressions and pronunciations like A. And these can be, I guess if you're being polite like brethren and sisters in Adelaide would be, would politely call them uncultured and uh, grammatically inadequate and probably some other terms as well. Let, let me say that this is now my opportunity to apologise to you up front here now if I do use any terms which appear uh, rough and crude and uncultured please try and look through all that and stay with me because we've got a lot of, lot of room to cover when looking at this prophecy of the obdurate nation. There's another thing about redneck Queensland farmers, their logic. It is illogical. It can't be called logic. And you know, it doesn't matter how many times you persist with them in arguing about how, how illogical their logic is, they retain it. And you know, they retain it from generation to generation. We have one, f one family up our way which has four generations alive at the same time, all using the same logic that they got from great-grandfather. And you can argue with them to your black and blue in the face. And in the end, you're pulling your hair out and you say, what is wrong with you people? After all this time, haven't you learnt anything? Now, that introduces us to our subject. So I want you to come over to Psalm 87. And as you turn over to Psalm 87, I want to tell you about my mother. My mother only had uh, one opportunity in her whole life to go to the land of Israel and she seized it with both her hands and off she went, leaving my father behind. We had better things he could invest his money in. When she came back from that trip, she said to me, when I walked through the Jaffa Gate into old Jerusalem, this feeling came over me. Psalm 87 verse 5. And of Zion it shall be said, this and that man was born in her, and the highest himself shall establish her. Yahweh shall count when he writeth up the people that this man was born there. You see, my mother had this feeling that she belonged there in old Jerusalem, that she was born there. And so Psalm 87 became one of her favourite passages. And I always remember her telling me that with such depth and feeling. Well, you know, about a dozen years later, I had my first opportunity to go to Jerusalem. We arrived in Jerusalem late in the evening. We walked into our hostel room and right there before us, straight out the window, was the Jaffa Gate. And I fell to sleep that night with the last vision in my mind of the Jaffa Gate. I arose the next morning and the first thing I saw out the window was the Jaffa Gate. And I was keen to get there. Don't ask me what I had for breakfast, but I do remember that our guide was lingering too long for breakfast. I wanted to get to that Jaffa Gate. So off I went to the Jaffa Gate. And I photographed it. And then I walked into the Jaffa Gate and stopped and looked around and waited for that feeling to come over me. And nothing happened. I thought, oh dear, this isn't good. So I decided I'd walk through the Jaffa Gate into the old city of Jerusalem itself and stop about 30 metres into the city and just 
wait for the feeling to catch up with me. And as I'm waiting for this feeling to catch up with me, I'm looking around and I notice something. Money changer, money changer, money changer, money changer. Four money changers, all within 30 metres, could be seen within 30 metres of that gate. And a feeling did come over me. I thought, what is wrong with you people? After all this time, haven't you learnt anything? This is the same issue that Jesus Christ had with you 2,000 years ago, and you're still doing it. And Psalm 87 was soon forgotten, and Zechariah 14 came into play for me, and I said, this whole place needs destroying by a great earthquake. Take it away. And you know what? That's exactly what's going to happen. Their eternal city will disappear. And quite frankly, I've got no problem with that now that I've seen it. By the way, um, those money changes are now called foreign exchanges, but it's the same thing, really. And it doesn't take long for you to have a look at their signs, and you'll see the word change or changer on those signs before very long. Now, for our purposes today, I want to pick out prophecies about the Jewish people themselves. Not so much about the nation or the state, but the Jewish people themselves. You see, when you visit Israel today, you immediately notice two groups of people. They're known as the secular Jews and the orthodox Jews. The secular Jews have no specific form of religion, really. They're not committed to anything. They are your everyday modern Jew who looks just like any other Western person that might even be visiting the place, except most of them are walking around with guns over their shoulders. And then on the other hand, you have the Orthodox Jews. And they stand out because of their code of dress. And... Um, those codes can change quite a bit. They can start from simple little skull caps to some very formal, full regalia of um, their mitre boxes on their heads and their black caps and gowns and prayer shawls and all those sort of things. So the term orthodox is fairly fluid in Israel and the world for that matter. Uh, and so are their practices. So you will have, say, Coptic Jews that, that are influenced by their Egyptian history and their African diaspora. Or you could have Sephardic Jews who are influenced by their Spanish and, Spanish and Portuguese uh, diaspora. And then you have the Ashkenazi Jews, which are influenced by their German diaspora. And then you can get Orthodox Jews and ultra-Orthodox Jews and then you can get Hasidic Jews and Haredi Jews and you can have Ashkenazi, Hasidic, ultra-Orthodox, etc, etc, etc. So there's a great variety of these Orthodox Jews, all of which have their own different beliefs and practices and focuses. But they all come under the same banner of Orthodox Jews or, or Judaism. And all of them are in unbelief of the Messiahship of Jesus. Now, for our purposes, we will focus largely on the Orthodox Jews because, really, they do wield quite some influence even amongst the secular Jews. For example, <coughs> at the moment, the caretaker Prime Minister of Israel, Yair Lapid, is a secular Jew. However, it was only about five or six or seven years ago that he was the politician who pushed the hardest for military exemption for ultra-Orthodox Jews. So clearly, the ultra-Orthodox Jews had wielded some influence upon Mr Lapid. You know, there's this other example in more recent times. You'll remember the, lately they've had the um, American elections. And Mr Trump, just before those elections, you will remember, 
was pulling together all these accords with these Arab nations around him, United Arab Emirates and Bahrain and so forth, and he was getting these great economic ties happening for Israel. He was doing them a great lot of good. And then came the election. And when the election was done and dusted and, and Mr. Uh, Mr. Donald Trump missed out, they had a look at what the voting criteria were as far as those who had voted and they looked at the Jewish section because surely the Jewish section was going to be supported by the, by, uh, um, the Jewish section would support Mr. Trump. Turned out they didn't. They in fact supported Mr. Biden. And the reason for that was because the ultra-Orthodox Jews who remain in America today were the ones who said, right back in 1948, you do not go back to Israel. Israel should not be a state. Messiah has not returned. He hasn't built a temple. We shouldn't be in the land of Israel. And so these ultra-Orthodox Jews had an influence upon the Jewish voters in America and they all voted for Mr Biden. So these ultra-Orthodox Jews and the Orthodox Jews as a whole do have a big influence on the people of Israel, whether they're secular or Orthodox. Well, let's go back in history then to establish <coughs> some of the original Orthodox roots. We'll come to Deuteronomy chapter 7. This is uh, going to be the law of Moses now, as understood by Judaism. But listen to it on its first pronunciation. Deuteronomy 7 verse 1. When Yahweh thy Elohim shall bring thee into the land whither thou goest to possess it, and hast cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites and the Girgashites and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than thou, and when Yahweh thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them, Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them, neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son, for they will turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods. So will the anger of Yahweh be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. But thus shalt ye deal with them. He shall destroy their altars, break down their images, cut down their groves, and burn their graven images with fire. For thou art an holy people unto Yahweh thy Elohim. Yahweh thy Elohim hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. Now, this law, this law actually preserved the Jewish race for 2,000 years of dispersion. They saw themselves as holy Chosen, special, picking up the words out of this, this, this law of Moses. They did not allow mixed marriages. And this was easily policed by them because if you're a Jew, to get married, you've got to go to a rabbi who was an Orthodox Jew. And so this law was wholly just and good for them uh, if it was ad administered correctly. You see, verse four, 4 tells us, why they were not to marry Gentiles, for they will turn away thy son from following me. Now look, we understand that. That's what we practice too, for the same reason. But somewhere along the historic timeline, orthodoxy changed the reason by focusing now just on verse 6, for thou art an holy people unto Yahweh thy Elohim. Yahweh thy Elohim hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself, above all people that are upon the face of the earth. And so orthodoxy said, you do not marry Gentiles because we are special and holy and chosen and we're above all those dirty goyim. Goyim being the word for Gentiles, plural. So by the time that Christ arrived upon the scene, they were exhibiting this, this very attitude, and not just in marriages either. 
You know, they had a practice in Christ's day that when they travelled abroad, upon returning to the, the very border of the, of the Holy Land, they stopped, they undid their sandals, they stepped barefooted into the Holy Land, they reached back over, picked up their sandals, shook the dust off them, the dirty Gentile dust, put them back into the Holy Land and put them on and away they went. Such was their attitude towards the goyim. Their, even their dirt was dirty and they'd have nothing to do with it. Now, you come with me to Luke chapter 20, where the Lord told a parable of the vineyard. One of several parables he told of the vineyard. And in this one, the owner sends his servants to receive the fruits of the vineyard and the servants were beaten and hurt and sent away empty and in the end he sent his beloved son whom they also killed. <clears throat> now you look at this in Luke chapter 20 and verse 15. <clears throat> so they cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. What therefore shall the Lord of the vineyard do unto them? He shall come and destroy these husbandmen and shall give the vineyard to others. And when they heard it, they said, God forbid. You see, the Jews in Christ's day said, God forbid. They knew that they were the husbandmen in the parable. They knew that the Lord of the vineyard was God. They knew that Jesus was saying, that God was going to destroy the Jewish husbandmen and then give his vineyard to other nations, the Goyim. And in utter horror of such an idea, they said, God forbid, this is no way possible that God would ever give his kingdom to dirty Goyim, ever. And to this day, Orthodoxy Jewry have perpetuated that belief from generation to generation, despite the fact they'd lost their kingdom, they'd lost their land, they'd lost their temple 2,000 years ago. Surely, wasn't that God destroying the Jewish husbandman? And you know, for 2,000 years, they had wandered from Goyim to Goyim, nation to nation. And you know, no matter what nation hosted them, they, the Orthodox Jews, still treated them as dirty Goyim. Only they were the special people. You see, it was that form of racism, this, that, that vilification of all the other nations which became one of the underlying reasons why the other nations have hated them the world over. Their segregation and their aloofness and their unusual orthodox practices became odious to their host nations. But after 2,000 years, they still haven't learnt, which begs the question, what will it take for them to admit that God had indeed cast off his people? What will it take? Well, there's one thing for sure. It's going to have to take something more than the Holocaust. Because the horrors of the Holocaust didn't change them. They still don't like Goyim. And I tell you... You feel it most when you go to the land of Israel. And, and I suggest that you go as a small group. So if you go as a big group, you're treated as tourists and you steed here and there to tourist sites. But if you go as a small group, you can go into their streets without them knowing that you are, in fact, English. They don't like the English. You can go into their streets without them knowing that you're Goyim. And you can have a look at the way in which they live and the way in which even the Orthodox Jews do not like Jews who are sympathisers of Goyim. 
Let me tell you about an experience of mine on my, on my first trip to, to Israel. Mind you, I thought I was going to be a, a little clever. And I thought I'd subtly uh, sidle up to this Orthodox Jew and ask him about Isaiah 53, you know, and I'd, I'd use the Ethiopian eunuch statement, you know, um, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or of some other man. So I, I sidled up to this man who was in his full regalia and I said to him, uh, excuse me, can I ask you a question about Isaiah chapter 53? And the response I got was a whole heap of Hebrew words and he just then walked off. And the only Hebrew word I understood was goy, singular for goyim. He had no time for me because I was goy. And I'm guessing he picked that up because I was speaking English. Wouldn't have been my Australian T-shirt I had on. But they've got no time for goy or goyim. So what will it take to change Orthodox Jewry? Well, let's consider the Holocaust first. You know, when I was going to school, I'm pretty sure that I was taught that there was two million Jews killed in the Holocaust. But today, you go to any Holocaust museum and they will emphatically tell you there were six million Jews killed in the Holocaust. Six million. And, you know, many Jewish authors have said that the Holocaust happened because... We allowed it to happen. And they're not going to let it happen again. It was the darkest moment in their history and they will never allow it to happen again. So in an effort to make sure that the world listened to them, Jews worldwide have banded together and they've established a Holocaust museum in every country in the world. There's one in Melbourne. I believe it's closed at the moment for renovations. But you know, the best Holocaust museum in the world is in Jerusalem. Far better than any other. And it's called Yad Vashem. And I've been to Yad Vashem twice, ten years apart. And I'm telling you, it's getting more and more impressive every time. You see, the Jews know how to make an impression, to make a visual impact that will last forever. So much so that, well, you can ask, well, no, you can't ask my wife, she didn't come here, but, but when she walked out of Yad Vashem, she said, the shoes, did you see the pile of shoes? I will never forget the shoes. And that's exactly what the Jews want. They want to make that impression. They want you to feel their pain and their shame and their reproach so that it never happens again. Again, again, whatever pronunciation. Now, <clears throat> now it's time to turn our attention to Isaiah chapter 49. Let me tell you that uh, as you turn there, this prophecy is no different to any other prophecy in that the initial audience was meant to see some relevance in their own days. Just as Deuteronomy 18 said, when a prophet speaketh in the name of Yahweh, the thing follow not, nor come to pass, the prophet hath spoken presumptuously, thou shalt not be afraid of him. So for every prophecy, the people of the day would were to see some sort of relevance in the, those days so that they would then attest to the veracity of the prophet. But the more interesting element is always the secondary and or the tertiary application of these prophecies. Okay, so here's Isaiah 49. <clears throat> Let's read verse 1 and 2. Listen, O Oz, unto me, and hearken, ye people, from far. Yahweh hath called me from the womb, from the bowels of my mother hath he made mention of my name, and he hath made my mouth like the sharp sword, and in the shadow of his hand hath he hid me, and he made me a polished shaft, in his quiver hath he hid me. <clears throat> now, of whom doth the prophet speak? Well, initially, that could be said of Hezekiah, called from his mother's womb, specially sharpened for a particular job. 
and so that he could see the folly of his father. And then he was hidden away so that he survived his father's rampage to offer his, all his children unto, to Moloch. So it could be said of, of Hezekiah. And that's why verse 3, and uh, it says, And said unto me, Thou art my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. Then I said, Well, I've laboured in vain. I've spent my strength for naught and in vain. Yet surely my judgment is with Yahweh and my work with my Elohim. And so Hezekiah, actually in Isaiah chapter 37, when Reb Shaker was rattling on the gates of Jerusalem and all, all hope appeared to be lost, Hezekiah sends a message to Isaiah and he said, the children are come to the birth and there's not strength to bring forth. You see, Hezekiah was describing how he had conceived this embryo of a spiritual nation out of the darkness of Ahaz's apostasy. And just as that spiritual baby is about to be born, Sennacherib's army is bashing on the gates to destroy them. I've spent my strength for naught and in vain. See, it's talking about Hezekiah. No, you and I know better than that. The secondary fulfilment is more interesting and more thorough. This is about Messiah. He was called from his mother's womb by name. And who by that very means was specially prepared like a sharp sword and a polished shaft in a quiver. But... But this is military terms. This is military prowess. Yes, but it was hidden at his first advent. You see? He was Yahweh's servant. He was the prince with Hale, in whom God would be glorified. But he wasn't correctly understood at his first advent. And he laboured amongst the Jews in vain. Even his own disciples forsook him and fled at the moment of his greatest need, and he could say, I spent my strength for naught, there's no one here. But verse 6 says, And he said, It is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. Yahweh's servant was not solely for Israel's salvation. He would be also a light, a light to the goyim, that the end of the earth might be saved. Who lives in the end of the earth? In Isaiah's day, goyim. The Jews didn't. You know, this whole chapter is about the inclusion of the Gentiles. You look at verse 1. Listen, O isles, unto me. Who are these isles? Well, there's one thing for sure. Israel doesn't have any islands, so it can't be them. It has to be the Goyim. Now, let's, uh, let's go to verse 14. But Zion said, Yahweh hath forsaken me, and my Adonai hath forgotten me. You know, brothers and sisters and young people, I cannot imagine a better description of the Jewish mind during the Holocaust. I mean, you can read endless uh, quotations of people who were saying, Yahweh hath forsaken us, Jewish writers. Yet this isn't speaking about the Holocaust. The verse either side proves that. The Holocaust was simply the catalyst that drove them back into the land. That's all. The Holocaust didn't change their minds and their hearts about Jesus of Nazareth, or the Goyim for that matter. In fact, the Holocaust only made their hearts more obdurate. Verse 14 is speaking of Armageddon. Now, you look at verse 19. It says, For thy waste and thy desolate places and the land of of thy destruction, the land singular. What land was that? Put a marker here in Isaiah chapter 49 and now let's come over to Zechariah chapter 13. And we're going to spend a, a few minutes here in the prophecies of Zechariah and try and piece them all together. Because Zechariah, a bit like Isaiah, 
can be a bit like an ADHD child and he's all over the place. So we're going to try and follow this through. What was the land of their destruction? Well, let's try Zechariah chapter 13 and verse 8. And it shall come to pass in that in all the land, Eretz, saith Yahweh, two parts therein shall be cut off and die, but the third shall be left therein. And I will bring the third part through the fire and will refine them as silver is refined and I'll try them as gold is tried. And they shall call on my name and I will hear them. I will say, it is my people. And they shall say, Yahweh is my God. Brethren, sisters and young people, this prophecy actually is quite disturbing. So I hope you have a fairly strong constitution. Because Zechariah 13 is futuristic. Hasn't happened yet. In fact, it keeps on saying, in that day, in that day, future tense, verse 1, verse 2, verse 4, verse 9, hasn't happened yet, they shall call on my name, verse 6, hasn't happened yet. So when verse 8 said, two parts therein shall be cut off and die, that is yet to happen in that land of their destruction. Two-thirds of the Jewish population in that land will die at Armageddon. Two thirds. 66.6%. That's horrific. Do you know what the population of Israel is? 2021, last year, their population was 9,440,000. Which means, if Armageddon happens tomorrow, the Jewish death toll will be 6.3 million people more than the Holocaust. But the Jews are determined that that will never, ever happen again. There will be another Holocaust. And this time it's going to happen in their own land. And I tell you, that will completely crush the Jewish spirit, whether they're orthodox or secular. You look at Zechariah chapter 14, verse 1. Behold, the day of Yahweh cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I'll gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken. And the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Can you possibly imagine the impact of that on a Jew? especially an Orthodox Jew. Jerusalem, their eternal city, captured again by those filthy Russian goyim. How are they going to handle that? No Jew will lift up his head. Half of them are actually dragged off to POW camps or concentration camps. The Holocaust is happening to them all over again. The shame as they're dragged off as a broken and dejected people dragging their feet in the dust as they led off to captivity. And two-thirds of the population is dead. Imagine the pain. What more could go wrong for them? Well, I'll tell you. Come back to chapter 13 and verse 8. Now, and I want you to watch this time how I read this, because perhaps you haven't noticed this before. Okay? Zechariah chapter 13, verse 8. It shall come to pass that in all the land, saith Yahweh, two, thirds, two, two parts therein shall be cut off and die, but the third shall be left therein, and, on top of that, and I'll bring the third part through. Look at that next word. That's not a pronoun. That's a definite article. So he's not saying, and I'll bring the third part through that fire of verse 8. He's saying, no, this is the fire. On top of what's happened in verse 8, I will bring them through the fire. And look at the fire. It has two purposes. I'll refine them as silver is refined. And, on top of that, we'll try them as gold is tried. 
What more could God do to them? A lot. He's already killed 6.3 million of them. What could be worse than that? Well, here it is in Zechariah chapter 14 and verse 4. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall be removed to the north, and half of it toward the south. And ye shall flee to the valley of the mountain, for the valley of the mountain shall reach unto Azel. Yea, ye shall flee like ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Isaiah, king of Judah. And Yahweh my Elohim shall come. And all the saints with thee. That's telling us that the whole of Jerusalem will be swallowed up in an earthquake. The whole city, gone. Verse 10 tells us that it will be just this great big flat plain as far as you can see. Ezekiel 38 and verse 20 tells us that every wall in Jerusalem shall fall to the ground. Every wall, including the Wailing Wall, fall to the ground. The whole city is going to disappear. You imagine the decimated Jews watching their whole city crumble and fall to pieces. Not just their house, the whole city. Talk about dragging them through the fire to refine them as silver. But there's more. Just, as, just when they're as shell-shocked as they could ever be, as they're watching all the dust and the sounds of screeching, twisting iron and concrete crumbling, this spirit being appears out of the dust. And their captors, their Russian captors, bolt and leave them behind. And from behind this spirit being comes this spirit army that pursues after their captors. But the captain remains. And the captain leans over to help the Jews to lift them up out of the dust of the earth. And they notice something. Zechariah 13 and verse 6 and one shall say unto him what are these wounds in thine hands and then he shall answer those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends I don't know how to express that moment brothers and sisters you imagine a Jew trying to come to terms with that revelation. This was clearly their Messiah. He's come to save them, but look at his hands. And, and listen to what he said about those hands. Of all the things, you know, for, for 2,000 years, every Dirty Goyim nation of the world had said that Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah and that, that we Jews killed him and, and that God had rejected us for, for doing that. And, and, and now look, we Jews got it all wrong. How could we have got it so wrong? How are we, gonna, how are we going to, to, to live with the shame of this? We, we just... Worthless, stupid, stubborn. Talk about bringing them through the fire to refine them as gold. Now let's look at Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 9. It shall come to pass in that day that I'll seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem and I'll pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. In that day shall there be a great mourning in Jerusalem as a mourning of Hadad women in the valley of Megiddo, and the land shall mourn every family apart. 
the family of the house of David apart and their wives apart, the family of the house of Nathan apart and their wives apart, the family of the house of Levi apart and their wives apart, the family of Shimei or Simeon apart and their wives apart. All the families that remain, every family apart and their wives apart. Now, brethren, sisters and young people, that's not a normal Jewish mourning. The Jews are a demonstrative people. You know, even in the days of our Lord, they had hired mourners at funerals to express this great public display of anguish. But this, this is unbelievable. The house of David apart from the house of Nathan. Nathan was the son of David. You know, if ever you need your family around you, it's when you're in great grief. But no, not here. Every family apart, and even within each family, the husband mourned on his own, apart from his wife, who was also over here mourning her heart out alone as well. And Simeon and Levi, you know, the, the instruments of cruelty, the hardened men that could walk into a city and slay every single man without an inch of remorse. They're mourning individually, apart, brokenhearted. And Levi, of all people, I mean, Levi means the joiner. They were the ones who brought the, the nation together by a knowledge of God's law. They couldn't keep them together. They couldn't even keep their own households together. They couldn't be joined. They each individually mourned in their own privacy and shame. Such will be the shame and the grief. Such will be the refiner's fire. Now it's time to come back to Isaiah chapter 49. After all that has befallen the Jews, Isaiah now paints a picture of her as a bereaved woman and a bereaved mother. Isaiah 49 verse 21. Then shalt thou say in thine heart, Who hath begotten me these, seeing I have lost my children, and am desolate, a captive, and removing to and fro? And who hath brought up, the, up these? Behold, I was left alone. These, where had they been? And look, you can, you can hear the incredulity in her voice, can't you? She was alone. She was a vagabond. She was childless. She was desolate. She had nothing. No home, no husband, no children, no money, not even a city anymore. Nothing. Completely bereft. Nothing left to live for. And totally, totally gutted, to use an old crude fisherman's term. She's got nothing inside her anymore. No drive, no desire, no inclination. And then there's a sound of children. And they start appearing through the settling dust. And they're calling her Amy, mother. And she's shocked. Where did they come from? She truly believed that they were finished. Wiped out. But here now are all these little Jewish children coming to her. And she's in shock. Here's the next generation. They're alive. There's hope. But where did they come from? Verse 22. Then saith Adonai Yahweh, Behold, I will lift up mine hand to the Gentiles and set up my standard to the people, and they shall bring thy sons in their arms, look at the margin, and they and thy daughters shall be carried upon their shoulders. Oh my. That is not a picture that an orthodox Jew would relish today. You dirty goyim, you do not touch our children. No way. But look at this picture. As the margin said, the goyim bring their sons in their bosom, cuddled up close to their heart. And your daughters 
are happily carried on the shoulders of the goyim in a carefree manner. You see, things are different now, verse 23. And kings shall be thy nursing fathers, and their queens thy nursing mothers. They shall bow down to thee with their face toward the earth and lick up the dust of thy feet. Well, we heard that before. What a turn of events. Kings and queens of the Goyim nations, the ones where they had been dispersed for 2,000 years, are all now coming to them and bringing to them their children to honour them as well and to lick up the dust of their feet. The Goyim on this occasion will be prepared to admit that their own dust was indeed unholy. Well, when the heart of the obdurate nation bends, God then turns their fortunes and they become the head and not the tail. It's just as Romans 11 said, they are grafted back in again into the original Jewish hope and so all Israel shall be saved. But what a shocking journey it will be. Worse than the Holocaust, they will be brought very low. Their children are going to be slain. All their possessions gone. They've got no money. They've got no home. They've got no city. Utter desolation, weeping and gnashing of teeth, as the Lord put it. And then in Isaiah 60 and verse 9, this also happens. Surely the isles shall wait for me, and the ships of Tarshish first, to bring thy sons from far, their silver and their gold with them unto the name of Yahweh thy Elohim and to the Holy One of Israel because he hath glorified thee. Not only do the Gentiles bring them their children, they also bring them silver and gold. Whoa, what a turn of events that is. You mean we don't need to set up money changes anymore and stretch the margins to make a profit and to fleece the goyim? No, the goyim will turn up and they'll just give you the money. There you go, silver and gold, have it. Unbelievable. And you know, that's when, I, uh, when Psalm 126 happens all over again. When, when Yahweh turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dreamed. So then, Let's wrap this up with this final message. The Jews are, to this day, an obdurate nation. Brother Thomas said that they would return to the land in unbelief of the Messiahship of Jesus, and he was absolutely correct. Therefore, they'll have to be brought very low. You'll have to break their pride and break their spirit and break every one of their possessions and destroy their eternal city and he'll break their heart. And then Yahweh and his Christ will give the Jews another chance. Brothers and sisters and young people, all of you are goyim by birth. You don't get a second chance. Your only ch chance is right now. So do your best. The only chance you'll ever get.